Hello, gorgeous. Welcome to HG Radio, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration. Here is your co-founder and host, Kim Becker. Hello, gorgeous. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Kim Becker, and this is Hello, Gorgeous, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration on Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and soul. Our guest today is Mary Latham. Mary has been on the road since October of 2016, compiling stories of human kindness in all 50 states. She calls her mission more good. And at the end result of her trip will be a book full of stories of acts of human kindness, hope and inspiration that will be put into hospital waiting rooms. She stays with strangers to fund her trip and she has been in 150 homes to date. She has driven over 41,500 miles in her mother's old car as a personal piece of the mission since her mother inspired her to look for the good before she died of cancer in 2013. Mary has been searching for it since is for it ever since and is currently headed to her 49th state, Hawaii, with only New York left to hit. Hi, Mary, and welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited, and I am honored to say that when you came through Indiana, I actually got to meet you. And I was so grateful that Aaliyah brought us together and that we were able to meet you in person and hear more of your story, which is why I was so glad that we were able to connect and that you get to share your story with our listeners. Yes, yeah, no, that was awesome, and Aaliyah was amazing. It's it's so helpful when you meet people that are such good connectors along right? the road. <laughs> No kidding. So yeah. before we get into the questions and the mission, I tell me, tell your our listeners about your mom. Um, so my mom was the best, um, obviously a little biased, but she <laughs> she was kind of one of those people that you never really knew she was sick. She was just always smiling. She was always staying positive. Um, she was always doing kind of smaller acts of kindness um, that a lot of us didn't even know that she was doing half the time that we found out um, after she passed away, but she was just kind of always doing little, little acts of radiating kindness and, and had such a positive attitude. And um, she passed away a little over six years ago now um, from breast cancer. And then, so I'm curious about that too. I don't know that we talked about that when you were here. So did she find the lump herself or was it found through a mammogram through her, for her diagnosis? Yes, she found it, and um, and then it, she was clear for ten years. Um, okay. So I was eleven years old when she was originally diagnosed. So when they told us the news, I thought she was going to die because I didn't understand cancer, and it was just a really scary word for me. And so when she beat it, it was really exciting. Um, she kind of battled out every little thing that can go wrong in between that keep yeah. coming back, but she was just always just going and going and going, and um. And then when it returned, it had just um, kind of gone everywhere. And she had been getting surgery to have some fluid removed from around her heart and her heart stopped. So it was more so um, that surgery that kind of was was the ending. And that was kind of why I wanted to put something positive in these hospital waiting rooms, just because growing up with a mom that was sick a lot, I spent a lot of time in hospitals. And especially that last week where it just felt so hopeless and there were other people in that waiting room that were losing children and it was just such a depressing dark place and there was nothing in there not even you know a trashy magazine to know what color kim kardashian's painting her nail color so i just felt like we could really use something in these rooms that's right that's right well and what i love i mean when when you were here and you and i had an opportunity to talk and I was glad that you're thinking this way, but actually out of this whole mission, which we'll talk about in a minute, you'll actually have two books that'll come out of this. It's not only the people that you meet, but you're going to write a book about your journey that you've taken for these past several years, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, and I definitely, I realized pretty quick and it was two books. Right. It has to be because of what you've done. I mean, you are a true, um, you're a picture of human spirit. Just to be able to to take off and do what you've done, um, I think is is absolutely amazing. So let's talk about that. So how did this whole more good start and your and the journey that you've taken? So um, it was obviously inspired by my my optimistic mother, um, but I had been working at a law firm um, around the time that she was had become sick again. 
And I was working there just as a job to have health insurance and stability. I went to school for uh, education. I wanted to be a teacher. I did graphic design because I liked doing photography, but that wasn't a major. I was kind of bouncing all over the place. And I wanted to do wedding photography, but doing that in New York um, alone was not going to have me living anywhere besides a dump dumpster. So right. I had a couple other jobs lined up, and one of them was at a law firm where I was sitting um, the morning of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Ugh. And I had just gotten into work. I had to babysit that night right out, right when I got out of work for a six-year-old. And so I was very kid-oriented. I love children. Um, um, I had a couple different babysitting jobs at the time. And I just remember being very freaked out. And I, I mean, I think we all were. It was mm-hmm. a horrific thing. Um, but growing up without television shielded me a lot of the kind of worldly tragedies going on. And so I just remember being really, really scared. And I, uh, I was sitting there obsessing over the news, like we do. And my coworker walked by with a coffee from Starbucks. And, um, you know, he was like, oh, you should have come today because we would usually go together once a week. And I said, yeah, I can afford it this week. And he said, no, it was free. And I kind of looked at him and I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, there was a guy in earlier buying gift cards because um, it was right before Christmas. So he was getting them for his employees and he randomly just got a hundred dollar gift card and told the lady to run it out on all the people behind him. Oh, wow. And it was just such a cool thing. You know, like you hear those stories, but I had never directly been impacted. Yeah. And um, it wasn't like I got the coffee, but you know, my friend, he had just turned 30 that year. He was going through a divorce. His mom had passed from cancer um, that year. Like there was just so much going on in his personal life. And he, you know, it was around the holidays and he had not, he was a really happy person. He had not really been happy in a while. And he was glowing about this free $4 coffee from a stranger. And it was just, it was a really cool thing. And so I, you know, I called my mom when he left and I would call her every morning, um, to check in on her and see how she was feeling. And I told her the little story. And then I quickly switched over to telling her about the shooting because we grew up in a home with no TV. So that was the home she was in and she didn't know about it. And I just kept going on and on and telling her all the details. And I was like, you know, how is there so much bad out there? I mean, everything is horrible in the world is going down and it's just so scary. And she said, Mary, got to focus on that coffee story you just told me, you know, there's always going to be tragedies and horrible things that will inevitably happen in our lives and in the world, but there'll always be more good out there if you look for it. And so then it was probably uh, a few weeks later that she had her surgery and, um, and passed away. And so that conversation kind of always stuck with me. There was a couple little things in between there, but you know, we'd have to talk for five hours on the phone, <laughs> but it was, um, it kind of led up to this realization that that conversation and that moment before she passed from her cancer was just so huge for me. And had it been a random moment in my life, maybe I would have overlooked it, but because of what was going on, it just, it made me really appreciate her words and just, they've kind of guided me ever since I've lost her. Wow. And so you decided to just in 2016, just literally get in the car and go across the United States and find more good. That that's, that's what you, that was put on your heart. Yeah. Um, I guess what happened at first was that I had started a project with a friend where I just wanted to highlight these stories to get them out more. I mean, people were on Facebook a lot, but it was kind of, it was, you know, end of 2012 going into 2013. And it was kind of that time where Facebook was switching over to this negative place. Like a lot mm-hmm. of people ranting about this and that, and, and just, it just felt very, um, very negative. And so I had to be on there all the time for my wedding photography. I was using it as a free marketing tool and posting photos of weddings and then getting jobs for, you know, so it was helpful to me, but I also didn't want to be on there because it was just so many, so many complainers. <laughs> so I right. thought, well, I'll, I'll put my positive stuff out there and that's how I'll get them. So I started putting these stories out and it was pretty quick that it lost momentum just because like anything, we start something, it's going really well. And then keeping it going is the hardest part. And so I think that instead of getting discouraged and feeling that the project was dying and it was a project in honor of her and she had died and just getting really negative, I thought, well, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to find the stories myself. And I kind of started making a plan. Um, and I am still planning uh, day by day over here <laughs> before our last few states. It's like really a day by day planning um, thing just because it's an organization of one and I'm trying to figure everything out on my own. So I, um, I just figured I'm just going to get in the car and go. And, um, 
I did. <laughs> wow. And so what does a typical day, like when you talk about your day of planning, like what does that look like? Um, you know, there's consistency and typical are just not words that I remember um, <laughs> in the last three years, just because every single day is different. You know, sure. sometimes you get to a home where they are not very linked into their community. And to be honest, I thought that would be the most helpful part. I mean, the people that I stay with is how I can support myself financially and emotionally. I mean, they're giving you a bed, they're giving you breakfast. Um, they're, you know, in a, in a home, a shelter that's safe. So that's helpful. And then also just the emotional stability of knowing, you know, I'm just one person alone in the middle of all these different places in the country where I've never been. So now I have a little piece of family there. Um, but a lot of the time I thought I'd get there and they would give me connections to their community and help find stories. And I mean, 75% of the time it's been, I get to these places and I go out and I dig up the stories and I bring them home and tell them about them. And then maybe they get involved or start volunteering at this place or this or that, uh, but it's been much more, you know, boots on the ground, digging up work, um, which I think is such a testament to the fact of why we feel so depressed and so sad and so scared in our country right now is because we don't even know what's going on in our back door. I mean, backyard. There's That's so right. much stuff going on. And, you know, I talk about different nonprofits or groups that I meet along the way to other people from the area. And they're like, I've never even heard of that. Mm -hmm. And like, here's these women that are working night after night tirelessly in their garages to set up these nonprofits and do all this amazing work in their community. And the people in their area don't even know about it. So right. I've gotten very protective of like all of these people that are working so hard for the good because there's other, other people out there that are just like, oh, everything's horrible and everyone's a bad person. And it's like, you don't even know all these people like, you know, and so it's been kind of uncovering a lot of the good too now. That's awesome. So, so how do you figure out where to stay? So usually I, like when I first began my journey, I had put out online a little video and explained why I was starting this, what it was, what I wanted it to be. And I said, you know, if anyone has an aunt in Texas or a cousin in California that will let me crash with them as I travel through, like, please let me know. And um, I started tagging people, friends and relatives, and people would send me emails. And then a lot of the time when I would go into areas, I would try to reach out to like the local paper um, or some type of media just so that people knew like, okay, this person's here. If we have a story, let's share it. Um, just because, you know, I, I didn't have any other way to get the exposure in these areas. And so um, people would reach out from that. So it quickly became, you know, from going from friends of friends of friends or family members to total strangers that there were not a connection in the world. Like Aaliyah, Aaliyah had right. no connection to, she saw me online somewhere and just sent me an email and sounded super upbeat and positive and wanted to help me as much as she could. And I was like, cool, I'll be there this day at this time. And thanks for offering. And it gives my dad a lot of stress. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt unsafe throughout your travels? I have not. Um, I have never felt unsafe in any of the homes. I definitely have experiences where you stay more in touch with them or, you know, um, some of them really get it. Some of them are just kind of offering you a place to stay. Yeah. But I've never felt scared of the people. Um, there's definitely been a large number of challenges, but um, no, not that. And, and you know, there was definitely moments on the trip where I, I had some experiences that made me start being a little bit more wary just because people were kind of inundating me with like, Oh, be careful on this highway, yes. you know, this is going on or this. And I just thought, you know, I got, I got myself pretty worked up in some, in an area that I stayed in that was just, it didn't feel very safe. And then I thought how hypocritical that I'm telling everyone how there's all these good people out there. And then I'm going to be scared of the people that I'm trying to defend and say that there's good people. I mean, obviously you have to be cautious, but to go in it thinking, oh, well, I don't know, this person might not be safe. It's like, you know, driving is not safe. That's or, right. You know, there's so many things that I'm doing that anything could go wrong. So to kind of feel like the people aren't going to be the help is was against what I was trying to prove. And right. so, um, yeah, I've, I've been really lucky.